Uh, okay, so um, hello everybody. Uh, I see that unfortunately uh, Dr. Pfefferman is uh, not yet with us. Let's hope that he will join us shortly. Uh, my name is Bartolomé Krzysztof. I'm uh, assistant professor at the Polish uh, at the Polish Academy of Sciences Institute of Political Studies. Uh, and I've got the great pleasure to chair this uh, this this event, this lecture with uh, Mateusz Maiman uh, on the topic of the Holocaust and the collective memory of uh, mountain uh, Jews. Uh, first of all, I would like to mention a few words. This meeting is organized within the framework of a dialogue program. Um, realized by the Institute of Political Studies uh, and financed by the Ministry of Education and Science of Poland. Uh, and it's, as I said already, the great pleasure for me to, uh, to chair it. Uh, I also see that Professor Mann joined us. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you uh, to join us the, for this meeting. Uh, our guest today is Mateusz Maimon. I will introduce him uh, in a while. Uh, after his lecture, the commentaries will be delivered by Irina Rebrova, who is also already with us, and uh, Kirill uh, Pfefferman. Uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce our today's speaker. Uh, Mateusz is a doctoral candidate in Jewish history at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich and a research associate at the Ernst Ludwig Ehrlich Scholarship Fund. Uh, his interests include oral history, Holocaust studies, uh, Caucasology, migration, and transnational history. His dissertation explores how the mountain Jews as a collective perpetuate the memory of the genocide committed against their nation during World War II. His research is based primarily on multi-durational oral history interviews conducted in Russia and Israel. In his work, he analyzes the factors that shape the culture of Holocaust remembrance in two countries where memory takes completely different forms. He presents a community partially excluded from the post-Soviet and Israeli communities of memory while struggling to connect with hegemonic national historical memories. Uh, before coming to uh, LMU, Mateusz received uh, a BA in Hebrew studies from Warsaw University and an MA in Jewish studies from the University of Heidelberg. He was also a visiting student at the St. Petersburg State University and at PIDEA, the European Institute for Jewish Studies in Stockholm. This year, two of his articles and a chapter in a collective monograph on the history of the Caucasian Jews will be published. So uh, please welcome Mateusz Maiman, our first and the most important speaker today. Uh, the commentaries will be delivered by Irina Rebrova, who is a historian working as a researcher at the Center for Research on anti-Semitism at TU Berlin. She's a research associate at the Haddasa Brandis Institute at Brandis University in USA. She also holds a Russian PhD degree uh, and MA in sociology in gender studies. She has published a number of articles on oral history, gender history, and social memory on World War II in Russian, English, and German academic journals and edited collections. Her newest book is Reconstructing Grassroots Holocaust Memory, The Case of the North Caucasus, published uh, last year by the Gruiter. Her current project deals with the creation and curation, the traveling exhibition about people with disabilities and Jewish doctors who became Nazi victims in Russia during World War II. Uh, and the second commentary uh, will be deli delivered by Kirill uh, Pfefferman, who is the senior lecturer uh, at Ariel University at Israel Heritage Department, History of the Jewish People in the, uh, in the modern, uh, modern Age. Uh, areas of expertise of uh, Mr. Pfefferman are the Holocaust in the occupied Soviet areas, World War II history of totalitarianism. He wrote extensively on these topics with an emphasis on the Crimea um, and the Caucasus. So after this introduction, uh, I just want to say uh, a couple of technical, uh, touch upon a couple of technical issues. Uh, so our meeting is scheduled for around two hours. Uh, in a while, I will give uh, a voice, I will pass the mic to Mateusz. Mateusz will deliver a lecture, lecture which will take around 45 to minutes to an hour. And then uh, we are expecting the 15 minutes commentaries first from Irina and then from Kirill. And after that, uh, I will uh, allow 
the participants, the listeners of our today's lecture to uh, ask the questions. So I really wish that we will have like a fruitful discussion. And uh, well, uh, Mateusz, the floor is yours, or I would, I should rather say the screen is yours. Uh, you got 45 minutes and we are listening carefully. Right, thank you very much indeed. So um, thank you very much for this introduction and for inviting me today. And I am uh, really thrilled and honored to be here and to have this opportunity to address you on the issue of the memory of the Holocaust in the Mountain Jewish community, uh, which has so far, let's be honest, received little attention both in academia and in um, Israeli or Russian public spaces. And before I show, uh, get into details and closer to the most crucial topics that will be covered during this lecture, I wish we had a look at a certain photograph. So now I will share my um, screen. Okay. okay, now it's shared, right? Right, okay. Uh, so here we go. Okay, so uh, you can see this photograph. And when I first saw this image, uh, I will be honest that I wonder what am I looking at? So in the foreground, a group of people, mostly middle-aged and older, are sitting and standing around the monument. Some women have their hair covered and their clothing and features attest to a rather non-European origins. The memorial consists of two parts, a column with two plaques bearing inscriptions in Russian and sculpture depicting a bent woman dressed in black. It is surrounded by a low fence of wood and brick. Fresh wreaths of bright flowers lie, uh, lie uh, at its base and on its pedestal. Sunny weather makes it easier to read the individual words of the inscription written in Russian, which is obscured by a freshly planted tree. So we can see that it's written 470 people are buried here. Inhabitants, in memory of the victims. Some people are festively dressed, but one looks in vain for party officials, pioneers, or flag bearers, or other elements that will give the whole scene an official Soviet character. In the background, we can see an endless grassy plain and a barely visible forest. And that is all. We don't know who the heroes of this scene are, what their nationality is, or what they actually have in common. We cannot say, um, unequivocally, where and when the photo was taken and what the purpose of their visit was. What we do know is the fact that they wanted to commemorate the victims, perhaps their friends and relatives, who were probably murdered and buried in this place. To this end, the whole group came to some remote, probably remote corner of the Soviet Union. They considered this event so significant that it was worth capturing on film. I think a similar photograph taken, let's say, uh, in Central, Central Europe would not cause the viewer to be as surprised and curious as I was. Uh, the site of commemorated events in Ukraine, Belarus, or Poland is somehow inscribed uh, in the landscapes of memory of those countries. However, such an unexpected or even contradictory combination of the Soviet meaning European in our understanding memorial site, with the non-European appearance of the participants, caused me a kind of cognitive dissonance, I would say. This will have to uh, suffice for the moment, and we will return to the above photograph at the end of this talk. So let's start maybe from some historical background. Uh, and from how my interest in the history of mountain Jews began. So it began almost five years ago, when I was invited to a large Caucasian wedding in southern Israel. Uh, and it was also the first time I heard from one of the participants about the fate of these people during the German occupation of the Caucasus at the turn of 1942-43. At the time, I, I was under the impression that it um, was a very under-researched topic. As it later turned out, there are several scholarly studies on the occupation and wartime fate of the mountain, mountain Jews. Nevertheless, no one has yet turned to the collective memory of survivors' descendants and to the area of perception of the Holocaust by those members of the community who lived in the territories spurred by the German occupation, Chechenia, Dagestan, and Azerbaijan. The awareness of these people about the extermination committed against their members of their nation has not yet been studied. 
To date, probably no scholar has studied how Caucasian newcomers, both those who immigrated early in their lives and those who came as adults, perceive and remember the Holocaust. There are neither data nor publication on how older generations passed on knowledge about the genocide during the Soviet era and whether the level of knowledge about the Holocaust changed significantly due to the massive immigration of the Caucasus Jews to Israel beginning in the early 1990s. In this talk, I will present some of the results of the research I conducted among the group in Israel and in the Russian North Caucasian republics of Dagestan, Kabardino-Balkaria, North Ossetia Alanya, and the Stavlopol Krai during the three years of my doctoral studies. Let's start from the terminology now and historical background. So uh, let us maybe begin with the term mountain Jews itself. So this is a long translation of the Russian exoethnonym. So exoethnonym is uh, an ethnonym used by those who do not belong to the uh, ethnic group it describes, let's say. So this exoethnonym Golskiy Yevdei in Russian was introduced in the early 19th century by the military administration of the Caucasus to distinguish this community from the Ashkenazi communities of the Russian Empire. Uh, so the name Mountain Jews is the translation of the Russian name given to this group by the um, administration. As if I remember correctly, I found sources as early as the 1840s who already uh, used this terminology. And the original self-definition of the community, so-called auto or endo-ethnonym, is Juhu. In plural, plural it's Juhuru or Juhurho, meaning simply Jew, Jews. And um, we can say that the ethnogenesis of the mountain Jews was often um, presented in a way that had little to do with uh, reliable historical research. So among the members of the group itself, um, the so-called antiquity discourse seems to be quite widespread, dating the Jewish presence in Persia and the Caucasus even to the eighth century before Christ's era. When the ten lost tribes were said to have been expelled from the Kingdom of Israel after the conquest by the now Assyrian Empire around the year 722 before Christ's era. Another oral tradition speaks of the sixth century before Christ and indicates that the mountain Jews are descendants of people from the ancient kingdom of Judah who fall into Babylonian captivity. According to yet another theory, as hard to confirm as the previous ones, the Jewish presence in the northeastern Caucasus dates back to the Sassanid Empire, so it's between 3rd and 7th um, century Christ era. And since the Caucasus was a strategically important frontier, it very often had some liberties and was not always guided by official policy of the emperors. And during the reigns of Sassanid kings, uh, the strength of the Zoroastrian clergy increased significantly, and the policy of religious tolerance gave way to the persecution of other religions. At this time, Christians and Jews uh, sought refuge in remote parts of the empire. And it was for this reason that the Jewish settlement in the Caucasus was to be found at expand. However, these theories cannot be proven. Hence, they should be considered legends. They probably constitute a part of a later oral tradition designed to emphasize the uniqueness, distinctiveness, and ancient origins of this very ethnic group. We find similar origin myths among the Georgian and Bukharian Jews. Therefore, they are by no means, by no means unique to the mountain Jews. Therefore, based on a, let's say, tangible historical evidence, one should really cautiously date the Jewish presence in Northeast Caucasus to the 16th, 17th centuries, since the oldest uh, remains of material culture, such as, for example, mountain Jewish matzevas, date from this period. And the mountain Jews are part of the Iranian Jewry, and they speak a dialect of Persian language, so-called Juhuli, the Jewish language. In 19th century sources, such as the writings of the ethnographer and traveler Yehuda Chodni, we find information about the influx of persecuted Jews from Persia who um, sought refuge in northern Azerbaijan and southern Dagestan in the 17th and 18th century. The arrival of Jews in the North Caucasus was thus a process that took place over several stages rather than a one-off wave of migration. What is certain is that the mountain Jews came to the Caucasus from Iran and then from the 19th century began to settle in other areas of what is now the Russian North Caucasus. 
Kabardino Balkaria, Karachai Cherkessia, Chechenia, and Stavropol Krai. Uh, and it should be also noted that the mountain Jewish communities experienced the Second World War and the Holocaust in a variety of ways, from ghettoization to mass shootings. After the so-called Case Blue Offensive between June and November 1942, German troops began their brief between two and a half uh, and four months, depending on the area, occupation of the Caucasus. They took control of several thousand mountain Jews who lived in Stavropol, the Kabardino Balkaria, and the North Ossetia Autonomous Socialist Soviet Republics. The Nazis knew of the existence of the mountain Jews before the invasion. Nevertheless, their ethnic composition was not entirely clear to them. The policy of the occupiers towards the Kafkazi Jews population varied depending on the place, time, and type of troops stationed on the territory. The first community of the mountain Jews, whose members were housed under the uh, auspices of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, was captured in Shalmyan Kohos in the Crimean Peninsula. In March 1942, Isaac Rubede stationed in the area in cooperation with the military gendarmerie and local collaborators gathered all 114 mountain Jews who inhabited the place and murdered them. A similar tragic fate befell some 850 Kafkazi residents of two collective farms in Bogdanovka and Nienzhinskoye uh, in Stavropol Krai, at the time it was Ozhjani Kizekrai, who were murdered in September and October 1942 respectively. The situation of the Caucasian Jewish community, which lived in Naljik, the capital of Kabardino Balkaria, was completely different. Uh, so there was like, there were numerous reasons why the Nazis refrained from killing the mountain Jews during the two-month occupation between late October 42 and early January 43. So unlike the population of the above mentioned collective farms, the mountain Jews had lived in Naljik for over 100 years. Uh, and maintained close and friendly relations with the local Muslims and were perceived as another indigenous people uh, of Kabardia. Although the German and Romanian soldiers carried out cruel actions, such as looting Jewish homes, ordering forced labor, and in the first days of the occupation, they killed several mountain Jews, mass killings still never occurred. <clears throat> In their recent work, Sufyan Zemuchov and William Eumanns present five factors that ensured mountain Jews survival. The first was the ability of the Nazi Jewish community to organize in the face of the threat, to secure their fate, and to seek help from the Kabardians. The second was their strategic decision to seek official recognition uh, as a different racial identity than the, uh, the, than the one destined for extermination. Third, they gained the support of the collaborating Kabardian government through the friendly relations between Nautic Jews and the local Muslim Kabardian leaders. Fourth, there is the so called Birkamp factor, named after the ruling SS officer of that name, who was convinced of the non Jewish identity of the mountain Jews. And finally, German so called scholarly research on the mountain Jews race was contradictory. So during the short period of occupation, they failed to develop a single coherent theory about their ethnicity, uh, what in fact saved them from genocide. So here we can see uh, how the Caucasus looked like during the Second World War. And here we have a map with um, all the places where uh, the mountain Jewish community lived during the occupation. So here we see the Shomian Kohos in Crimea, Naljik, two Kohoses, Bogdanov and Inzhysko, Istavropol Krai, and the town of Mozdok. So uh, here is also the map of Bogdanovka. So you can see it's basically situated in the middle of nowhere and of um, Inzhyskoye. In the Stavropol Krai. Here we see the typical inhabitants, uh, co-holders. So, uh, and at this point, I would like to briefly tell you about the progress of the research and the data that uh, was evaluated during my research. So, let's start with the fact that uh, Kafkazi Jews immigrated to Israel in two major waves. About 12,000 came in the 1970s and the early 1980s, and another 60,000 immigrated in the 1990s, along with the post-Soviet Aliyah wave of immigration. 
Manisha goal was to identify the various components of the culture of remembrance among several generations of the latter group. First, I decided to focus on the phenomenon to determine, to determine what factors shape human memory, how communities deal with trauma, how it is passed on with the family, within the family, what role family, community, and state play in creating a narrative about past events. Then, when I conducted a similar study in the Caucasus, I decided to change the form of my work slightly and focus on comparing these two communities and the factors that influence their perceptions of the Holocaust. Another reason was the lack of literature on the subject that would depict the inhomogeneous landscape of, landscape of Holocaust memory among the non-Ashkenazi Jewish communities in both Russia and Israel. My work seeks to trace the memorialization of the Mountain Jews Holocaust from the bottom up, both in the North Caucasus during the Soviet period and afterwards, and in Israel. I want to find out the relationship between dominant statewide discourse and Holocaust remembrance at the grassroots level of the community that was doubly excluded from the official Soviet slash Russian and Israeli politics of memory. The factors influencing our memorialization in the regional and national commemorative culture of both countries are analyzed, as well as the level of knowledge, culture, and practices of remembrance and commemorative efforts of the members of the group under study that did not significantly change the official war memory culture, uh, but were rather essential, as I assumed, elements of the group's identity. The research is mainly based on the oral interviews conducted with the narrators. In my work, the experiences of the second and later generations of the mountain Jews are primarily examined. Nevertheless, reference is also made to the Holocaust experience of the first generation in order to illustrate better or reinforce specific points of discussion. In total, 104 interviews were analyzed, 57 of which were collected during my field work, and 47 earlier interviews with survivors and eyewitnesses collected uh, by other or historians between the 1970s and 2010s. Most of my interviews were conducted with informants born after 1945, often but not exclusively gender, children and grandchildren of survivors. Uh, the number of female narrators is not much larger, as you can see, than the number of male narrators, so the sample is representative in terms of gender. In the corpus of survivors, the number of, number of interviews with the mountain Jewesses amounts to 35, in contrast to 27 interviews with men, which probably reflects the higher life expectancy of women both in Russia and in Israel. Uh, for the younger generations, the difference is uh, correspondingly 23 to 16, giving a final ratio of women to men of 59 to 45. In terms of nationality, both corpora contain only the life stories of mountain Jewish informants, supplemented by interviews with three Russian and Ukrainian witnesses to the mass shootings. Uh, we'll have a look at it in a sec. Um, so supplemented by interviews with that with three of uh, Russian and Ukrainian witnesses to the mass shootings in two collective farms uh, in the staff of Ukraine, I mean Bogdanovka and Nenzhevskoye, and one in Crimea. All the narrators were born in the former Soviet Union or already in the Russian Federation. Most of them in kabardino balkaria followed by Dagestan. 43 of them decided to emigrate to Israel in the 1990s and 2000s. Only three moved to the United States, and all three non-Jewish eyewitnesses remained in the area where they lived during World War II in Russia and Ukraine. In my opinion, it is worthwhile to look for people who experience events that might be of interest to the oral historian differently. If the researcher conducts interviews with people from the same circle and thus gains further contact with the subsequent uh, interlocutors, he or she will obtain a relatively homogeneous picture of the past. Hence, the decision to include and interview not only the survivors and their descendants of Kabardino Balkara and Stavlopolkai, but also to collect material for comparative analysis among Dagestani mountain Jews whose ancestors were not affected by the Holocaust. In the Northern Caucasus area and the mountain Jewish communities in Israel where, where I have worked, the essential element of the community framework is an extensive multi-generational family. 
oral history interviews are filled with uh, genealogical information that provides the matrix within which local events occurred. Descriptions of events generally focus on the individuals involved in them, identified not only by name, but also by their spouses, parents, ancestors, or other relatives. Thus, the most significant primary source for my, for my project is a sample of more multi-generational interviews conducted with the mountain Jewish Holocaust survivors and members of the younger generation. The transmission of memories is strongly linked to generational relationships. Uh, that is, people pass on their chosen memories to their children, providing them with a store of knowledge and a sense of identity. My study aims to explore the narratives about the war and the Holocaust that exist in different age groups of the mountain Jews and how they have developed across generations in the two different countries, Israel and Russia. Uh, and this um, intergenerational communication and family memory have a significant impact on a person's historical consciousness. Using the aforementioned approach, my, my work illuminates apparent differences between generations of the mountain Jews in Israel and the Russian Federation from a transnational perspective. Uh, the mountain Jews form large multi-generational families with up to several hundred family members. Most of them are related to each other, regardless of which part of the Caucasus a particular branch comes from. This, the strong oral, oral tradition, and the fact that both so-called Russian and Israeli mountain Jews tend to live in small urban communities where family and social ties remain extremely strong, prompted me to apply the methodology of multi-generational research. Since my project aims to capture perceptions and memories of a specific traumatic event and its consequences for subsequent generations, the methodology depends on a qualitative analysis of the data collected via semi-structured interviews. To obtain a broader picture uh, and a more in-depth analysis of the problem under investigation in this study, that is the memory of the Holocaust among the Jews of North Caucasus, I decided to rely almost exclusively on qualitative methods. Uh, and the initial phase of the research preparation, I composed um, a detailed questionnaire with uh, over 300 questions according to the structure interview methodology. However, once I began to research process, um, the research process, I quickly realized that a less structured interview characteristic of oral history might prove more effective in obtaining additional important information and codes that are somehow um, flitting in a closed conversational form. Furthermore, I draw on numerous documents and previous oral history interviews, hence the final decision to emphasize the qualitative method of semi-structure in-depth interview. I deliberately avoid referring to my um, interlocutors as interviewees, because the term interviewer, the terms interviewer and interviewee define the active and passive roles in the interview. I also prefer to use the um, descriptive terms, such as researcher, narrator, interlocutor, participant, uh, to break down the traditional distinction between authority and subjectivity, um, and to create a more, I would say, egalitarian research process. So in the following study, uh, oral history is used as a qualitative interview method based on interviews with over 100 mountain Jews, Holocaust survivors, and people born after the war. Uh, 57 were recorded by me personally, and the remaining 47 were uh, procured from archives. The narrators were selected to represent the population under study, and the criteria for recruitment were age, place of birth, and current place of residence. However, the small size of the data set means that it cannot be generalized to represent the overall North Caucasian Jewish population, as would be the case with quantitative research. And all interviews conducted for my research follow the similar pattern. So approaching potential uh, narrator uh, posed no particular problem. It was made possible for my relatives, uh, my mountain Jewish relatives, living in several southern and central cities in Israel, such as Derot, Bel Sheva, Ofakim, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Tel Aviv in the central part of the country, but also uh, those living in the Caucasus. And throughout the research period, I stayed with my relatives, which, which 
enabled me to observe their daily lives, holidays, weddings, and funerals. In addition, I received exceptional help from local Jewish communities activists in the Caucasus, especially in Mahachkawa, in Buinax, Mosdok, Nalchik, and Piatigoz. Each interview was preceded by initial contact with the narrator via social media, Facebook contacts or Odnaklasniki, telephone or email. Or se all sessions took place in a relaxed in uh, environment to make each narrator feel as comfortable as possible. All interviews went, were conducted in Russian to keep the collective material coherent and avoid any kind of um, complications entailed by translation from multiple languages and possible differences in terminology. This is uh, also due to the fact that the older generations of the mountain Jews in Israel had a greater difficulty in learning Hebrew and refused to be interviewed in any other language than uh, Russian or Jewfully. Interviews with 14 Holocaust survivors were conducted along the lines of those collected by oral historians with Nalchik Mountain Jews in the 1990s at the request of the Shoah Foundation. The first part of the questions um, elicited information on family relations and everyday life in Nalchik before the German occupation. The second corpus focused on the occupation period forced labor, looting, shootings, relations with uh, German and Romanian soldiers, trade, religion, uh, religious life, food situation, and living conditions until the town's liberation. The last the thematic complex examined the narrator's lives after the war, marriage, education, professional career, everyday life in the Soviet Union, and the factors that influenced the decision to emigrate to, to, emigrate to Israel or stay in Russia. The interview subjects of the younger generation fell into three groups. The first two in, for, uh, in the form of closed questions and the last in the form of open questions. After completing the brief life history forms, I proceeded to ask the questions contained in the previously prepared questionnaire. The first group of topics included the general profile of the narrators, language and educational practices and religious attitudes. Questions were also asked whether the narrators were familiar with the term Holocaust and whether their uh, relatives were prisoners in concentration camps. For interviews conducted in Israel, questions were also asked about the year and age at which the Aliyah was made. The second group included memories and memory practices related to the Shoah, the transmission of memory and knowledge in family, school, public settings, and uh, commemorative practices, such as Victory Day, in Russia and Yom HaShoah in Israel and others. Narrators were also asked about family experiences during the Great Patriotic War and the Holocaust, access to and knowledge of publications and other cultural texts about the war and the Shoah. This corpus also included questions about the presence of the war and the Holocaust in uh, conversations on everyday and special occasions, both in family settings and, and at work and school. In the case of Israel, a distinction was made between the pre- and post-migration periods. Participants were also asked about religious practice and national and ethnic affiliation. Finally, questions were asked about general knowledge of the war and the post-war period, such as the trials of former Nazis and their collaborators, personal acquaintance with survivors and war veterans, and the influence of the Israeli and Russian educational system on the memory of these events. The final thematic group addressed the embodied uh, effects of Holocaust memory on everyday life, personality, and political attitude. Specific questions were asked about antisemitism, Zionist views, narratives, and discourses about the Holocaust, the presence of this topic in milieus such as community centers and synagogues. Although a questionnaire was given for each billboard site, I was able to um, take the initiative to restructure the interviews as the conversation progressed. And this flexibility allowed me to have a more open and candid dialogue with participants and uh, provided the opportunity to obtain, I would say, additional data that could not have been um, anticipated. So uh, the interview process uh, was accompanied by extensive archival research. And um, because of the smaller scale of the phenomenon, available archival material is also considerably more modest than in the case of the Holocaust of Ashkenazi Jews in the same area. 
has the decision to include previously unexamined pre-war and post-war archival materials from state archives in the Caucasus to present the local community in a broader historical context that is lacking in the literature on the subject. To gain insight in the mountain Jewish perspective on the Holocaust, several archives and sources were visited and evaluated in preparation for the interview study. And at this point, um, I would like to introduce and briefly discuss some primary sources that I collected during my research in various archives in Israel, Russia, um, both in Moscow and the North Caucasus, the United States, France, and Germany. And they fall into several categories, I would say. And the first are individual idol documents, such as memoirs, testimonies, and letters produced by the mountain Jews during and after the war. The second are documents of uh, Soviet and Russian state organs. And this rich collection forms the basis for a description of the situation of the Jewish community on the territory of the Caucasus during the period of Soviet power and soon after its collapse. And among them are documents that directly describe the occupation period, including testimonies collected by the Extraordinary State Commission about the looting and crimes committed by the Nazi occupiers. These documents uh, show the ever vivid picture of atrocities committed by German and Romanian soldiers, confirmed by the testimonies collected in later years and preserved in family memory. And another category consists of documents from state-controlled institutions promoting agricultural labor among Soviet Jews, such as POMZ, OZ, and Agrojant. And these documents are a valuable source of information on the settlement of the mountain Jews in collective farms established under the aegis of, the, uh, of these organizations in Crimea and Stavropol Krai, where mass shootings took place during the war. The next category is oral history projects involving, among others, the mountain Jews. This include the interviews collected in Israel by Mordechai Altruev and by Konstantin Nidoshnik, and in Russia by the Shoah Foundation, as well as the testimonies collected by Yahadin Unum. And Yahadin Unum is a French organization dedicated to uh, locating and commemorating the sites of mass shootings of Jews and Roma, carried out mainly by the Isaac Gruppen in Central and Eastern Europe. And these collections are a source of information, the collective memory of the war, the occupation, and the Holocaust. And the last group is the collection of the Anti-Fascist Committee, uh, both in Russian and Yiddish, which contains individual notes, articles, and reports on the heroism of the mountain Jews on the front of the Great Patriotic War, the awarding of the highest state orders, extraordinary achievements of Caucasian um, Kolkhozniks, as well as atrocities in Nalchik and other towns and villages of the North Caucasus. Uh, here we can see the sources of, um, of interviews from different collections, including oral history division of Abraham Harman Institute in Jerusalem, uh, visual history um, archive from University of Southern California Shoah Foundation, Yahat in Unum, Yad Vashem archive, Dr. Ina Lebrova's private archive, and uh, those from my own research. Okay, so the results uh, of my study indicate the existence of a collective memory of the Holocaust among the mountain Jews living in Russia and Israel, based on a strong sense of national identity and multi-generational family ties. The field research conducted also, conducted also confirmed most of my hypotheses. So um, let us then start with some common elements of collective memory. By common, I mean common for both uh, the mountain Jews in Russia and those who immigrated to Israel. So the most important point that uh, emerged from the interviews is that all the narrators have at least a minimal knowledge and awareness of the Holocaust acquired during the Soviet period or expanded after their immigration to Israel. In the Soviet period, this knowledge concerned mainly the experiences of Ashkenazi Jews. Concentration camps, Auschwitz and Babiara as symbol places, and to a lesser extent, ghettos. It results from the war experiences of the citizens of the Soviet Union murdered in mass executions and sent to Auschwitz as prisoners of war. In the Soviet period, the memory of the genocide of the mountain Jews actually functioned only in the German-occupied 
former Gemma occupied town of Nalchik and the family memories of the former inhabitants of Yenzhisko and Bogdanovka to, who managed to survive and move to other regions of the Caucasus after the war. And at this point, I would like to return to the photo with which we began our meeting. Uh, and I found prints of this picture in family albums in several mountain Jewish households, both in Israel and Russia. Along with the other images uh, we can see here, it represents a tradition that developed among the Nalchik Jews, mostly Nalchik Jews, in the early 1960s. Namely, every year on 9th of May, Victory Day, groups of people would come to Bogdanovka to remember their murdered loved ones, their murdered relatives, and mourn at the site of their mass grave. The choice of this date probably had practical reasons because it was a public holiday in the Soviet Union and it's still a public holiday in Russia. But on the other hand, this date seems to have a double symbolic meaning. So Victory Day being used to commemorate the victims. I think it underlines the kind of rupture that still exists in the mountain Jewish community. On the one hand, uh, they were shaped by the official Soviet narrative of the heroism, sacrifice and success of the Red Army in which there was no room at all until the 1960s to, rely, to reliably represent the sufferings of the Jewish people and not to treat all victims of the war and the Holocaust as peaceful Soviet citizens murdered by fascists. Thus, the situation, uh, the situation depicted in this photograph is a unique manifestation of the grassroots efforts to commemorate the victims or even oppose the authorities' official narrative, which contradicts the truth. This proves that the memory of the mountain Jews Holocaust functioned at the level of family memory among people who were connected to the victims through family ties. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, the Holocaust started to occupy an essential place in the memory of the mountain Jews. Although a minority of them had relatives who perished in the Shoah, I have not met a single person who today would follow the Soviet narrative of viewing his or her relatives only as peaceful Soviet civilians murdered by the fascists and not as victims of the Holocaust. This is especially true for people whose ancestors came from Nalchik, Bogdanovka, and Mianzhenskoy. At the same time, the majority of study participants claimed that for the mountain Jews Jewish community, the Great Patriotic War of 1941-45 was a more significant and traumatic experience than the Holocaust. This is related to the greater number of victims, uh, because about 1,000 mountain Jews died in the Holocaust and at least 3,000 on the fronts of the Great Patriotic War, and the relatively short duration of the occupation of North Caucasus compared to, for example, Ukraine. And most narrators uh, perceive the Holocaust as part of the experience of the Great Patriotic War, although they acknowledge the uniqueness, um, its uniqueness, compared to the experiences of other nations of the Soviet Union. And awareness of the Nazi genocide of European Jews is not significantly higher uh, in the second and third generations of the descendants of victims than among the descendants of those mountain Jews who lived in the areas not conquered by German troops. Uh, however, several of the narrators originating from Dagestan, living in both Russia and Israel, heard for the first time during our conversation that the mountain Jews were also victims of the Holocaust. They knew about the Ashkenazi Jewish Holocaust, but not about the mountain Jewish Holocaust, as we can call it. There were mainly people in the 65 plus age group and with only primary education. At the same time, their level of knowledge about the war and the European Jews Holocaust did not differ significantly from that represented by the other narrators. And uh, another important theme uh, presented during uh, these interviews is the exclusion of Jews in general and Caucasian Jews in particular from the official representation of the Soviet struggling family, along with the denial of their unique suffering, which made this group politically invisible without official um, recognition of their unique collective identity. And since the 1980s, um, the exclusion of the mountain Jews from the history of the Holocaust has been highlighted in several non-academic books published on the subject, both in Israel and the Russian Federation. Uh, one of these books we can see here is called Plain Niki Salman Sala. It was published in 1984 in Jerusalem. The other book, Zarzhiva uh, Pogdibionnya, was published in 2004 in Russia. Both authors are uh, of mountain Jewish origin. 
Unfortunately, none of my uh, narrators were aware of these publications, perhaps due to their small, small circulation and difficult uh, accessibility. And for most survey respondents, interest in the role of uh, in the role Jews played in the struggle against the Nazis seems to be as strong as interest in the suffering of Jews. They often emphasize the heroic uh, attitude that distinguished mountain Jews awarded the title Hero of Soviet Union. In their memory, the war still functions as the central legitimizing myth of the Soviet system in which they wish their ancestors to have their share. It is also common to emphasize the overwhelming number of mountain Jewish heroes compared to the Jews from the European part of the USSR. Uh, as Tzvi Gitelman notes, quote, for Soviet and post-Soviet Jews, what happened during the war uh, is of extraordinary interest for obvious reasons. But unlike in the West, there is no theorizing about the psychological, sociological, and theological dimensions of the Shoah, perhaps because we are dealing with a culture in which the collective is more important than the individual, end quote. And here we can see uh, two photographs. One is from Nalchik, from the school named after Isai Ilazadov, uh, a mountain Jew and hero of the Soviet Union who perished during the war. Uh, and the second one was taken in the town of um, Hasadyot in the Republic of Dagestan. And uh, this is a group of uh, youth uh, celebrating the 9th of May um, celebration. Uh, and they're standing in front of the house where Alexander Shubayev lived. Alexander Shubayev was also a mountain Jew, uh, a soldier who was taken to captivity. And he participated uh, in so-called prisoner revolt that took place on October 14, 1943, if I remember correctly, uh, in, in Sobibor extermination camp. And so those are two examples of this heroizing uh, approach towards the mountain Jewish veterans and uh, soldiers of the front, on the front of the Second World War. And also, uh, as for the presence of the Holocaust team in the Soviet school curriculum, the recollections of the narrators are highly uh, varied. So some claim that there were lessons on the Holocaust in their elementary and middle schools, while others do not recall that the subject was even in the classroom, was even in the classroom, or, or that a separate lessons was, uh, lesson was devoted to it. This is not so much due to differences in the curriculum or textbook content, I suppose, which was strictly controlled by the Ministry of Education, but rather to the initiative of some history teachers themselves who decided to discuss politically uncomfortable topics with the students. Uh, and generations who grew up in Israel have a greater knowledge of the European Jewry Holocaust than those who grew up in the USSR due to different educational system, different public discourse about the Holocaust and World War II, and access to various sources of information. At the same time, the knowledge, memory, and meaning attributed to the extermination of the Jews of the Caucasus um, are, as are much more noticeable and present in the consciousness of these generations who grew up in the USSR, even if they immigrated to Israel. And as far as the influence of so-called Yede Memoir sites of memory is concerned, some respondents had visited places of extermination in the Caucasus that we can see here. So on the left, it's Mianzinsko, on the right, it's Bogdanovka. Uh, so they had visited places of extermination in the Caucasus. However, they had the first opportunity to do so only after immigrating to Israel. Uh, and I mean here mostly uh, those mountain Jews who immigrated from Dagestan in this case. And in some Israeli towns, the community erected memorials dedicated to the soldiers and veterans of the Second World War. Uh, and although none of these memorials are dedicated exclusively to Soviet war veterans or Caucasian victims of the Holocaust, they host celebration of uh, 9th of May Victory Day and Yom HaShoah, in which the Caucasian community participates in large numbers. Uh, the only monument dedicated to the memory of the Caucasian Jews, victims of the Holocaust, was erected in the cemetery in the town of Hadera, with donations from members of the community. It consists of two inscriptions uh, commemorating the victims without mentioning their names. 
However, it is only a local memorial and knowledge of it is, its existence is not, it's, it's not widespread, even among the monk and Jews in other Israeli cities. Uh, and despite the increasing availability of information and scholarly studies on the subject, an overwhelming majority of the study participants admitted that they have not uh, purchased or read any printed publications on the subject of the war and the Holocaust since their arrival in Israel. Instead, their main source of information has become the internet. Many short articles published on the stmegi.com website, which covers the life of the mountain Jewish community around the world. Nowadays, an essential role in expanding their knowledge is also played by television programs, as well as films and TV series broadcast on the eve of Yom HaShoah celebrations. So the transmission of trauma is generally studied when it is passed from Holocaust survivor to their children and grandchildren. However, as the post-Holocaust and post-war generations of the mountain Jews have come of age in Israel, the Holocaust has become part of their collective identity. In the Caucasus, on the other hand, the memory of the Holocaust is still overshadowed by the official narrative of the Great Patriotic War, which was a defining event for collective memory in both the USSR and modern Russia. These two distinct post-Holocaust generations exhibit symptoms of collective memory that is passed on not only through family histories, but through school uh, curricula, secondhand narratives, books, the press, films, and the internet. The specific group my research focuses on is a minority shaped by their post-colonial heritage of the Soviet Union and post-migration processes in Israel. For some, the right to their own memories and traumas was overshadowed by the Soviet and Russian national narrative of the Great Patriotic War. For others, fundamental changes in the perception of the Holocaust came through contact with collective memory of Israeli society, which focuses on the experience of European Jews and emphasizes the tragedy of concentration camps and ghettos. My research addresses memory that is not prominent in the public sphere and remembering that it became a way to assert identity. My study of the intergenerational transmission of Holocaust memory examines the differences between individual and collective memory among the mountain Jews who live in both Russian slash post-Soviet and Israeli slash post-migrant milieus. Uh, based on the collective comparative material, I demonstrate the existence of a community of memory between Caucasian Jews who are shaped uh, by the mainstream narrative about the Great Patriotic War and those who immigrated to Israel, among whom the narrative of the Holocaust as a significant event in the history of the Jewish people prevails. In discussing the phenomenon of collective memory, I cost their family as the main frame. Nonetheless, by analyzing the testimonies of Holocaust survivors within the framework of collective and cultural theories of memory, I do not prioritize familial relationships over affiliated ones keeping in mind that the latter are necessary for any large-scale collective remembering. On the other hand, in analyzing the interviews with the younger generation, I focus on the transgenerational transmissions of embodied memory, primarily in the domestic sphere, placing the family at the center. For both groups of oral testimonies, the importance of via the memoir, sites of memory, is also analyzed. Aleida Asman distinguishes the memory of the vanquished from the memory of the victors and the memory of the victims from the memory of the perpetrators as different forms of collective memory. In the case of the memory of victims, it is essential to distinguish between heroic and traumatic memory. The heroic memory of the victims is seen as the memory of the martyrs. A martyr believes in a specific idea, in a nation or in God. The death of a martyr is terrible but it has a deeper meaning. Since it is unbearable to imagine that millions of people were murdered during the Holocaust for no reason, they are called martyrs to add a symbolic dimension to their deaths. On the other hand, traumatic memory is linked to the passivity of the victims. The persecuted were not fighters. They succumbed to destructive power. They were not ready to break their silence and resist. In the case of the mountain Jews, both of those, uh, both of these memories can be observed. On the one hand, their memory as victors is connected with the memory of the Red Army's heroic victory over fascists in the Great Patriotic War. People tend to idealize and heroize those events and recall them more often. On the other hand, their second heritage is the traumatic memory of the Holocaust. 
the memory of the victims, which, however, differs fundamentally from that of European Jews. So, uh, okay, so thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I look forward to listening to your comments and, um, and answering your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Matos, for this uh, very fascinating uh, uh, lecture. Uh, before I will pass the mic to uh, our commentators, I just will say a few words about the technical issues related with our Q&A, which we'll have after the commentaries. So uh, if anyone uh, after the commentaries from Irina and Kirill wants to ask the question to Mateusz, please uh, down below, you have a chat. Uh, just write down, I would like to ask the question in whatever language. Uh, if someone is not uh, fully comfortable with uh, asking the question in English, then you can also write the question in Russian or in Polish in chat, and then I will translate it in English and ask Mateusz. Uh, so uh, I'm passing the mic to Irina. The floor is yours, and we are waiting for your uh, commentary. 15 minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, the what you can hear me uh, because I'm not at home and <laughs> you see my <laughs> background and so on and so forth. But it is uh, very well. So that's uh, okay. So uh, first of all, I would like to say many thanks to Mateusz uh, for this very interesting presentation, and uh, I'm very looking for your future uh, PhD thesis because it would be a very, very, very important um, step uh, in the academy. Uh, since uh, there is no a lot of um, research uh, re researchers of uh, this particular topic, and. Uh, well, from my side, I can say uh, the funny story because uh, each time I make a presentation uh, e about my own topics and I'm dealing with Holocaust memory politics uh, in North Caucasus and I only mentioned that there were several types of groups, uh, several uh, uh, Jewish communities such as Ashkenazi, Mountain Jews and Karaims and only one sentence because it's not the, the main uh, point of my topics uh, always and uh, after my presentation I always 100% ha uh, uh, receive a question who mountain Jews are could you please specify and now <laughs> I'm ho I hope that uh, this question will uh, I would uh, uh, never uh, specify this question before I can address it to you Mateusz and <laughs> we will be this um think uh, I received. So uh, to the, um, I would like uh, not make more comments, but uh, I will say something and ask a question because I think that these uh, um, com uh, comments and uh, questions would be more useful for you and uh, maybe for me also to clarify something, some cases that uh, I'm interested also in. Uh, so, first of all, of all, of all you told about um, five reasons of um, mountain Jew survival. So, I was, it's not your ideas, uh, you received uh, them from the other historians and you named all these five reasons and I'm very interested in that. Again, uh, uh, talking about my research, I uh, never paid attention to these things and uh, um, I was uh, pretty interested in these uh, different um, academy result, uh, results, but still, uh, can we go uh, further and on, uh, and uh, can we try to um, um, think about uh, the your own. Uh, achievements in your um, research and uh, your own uh, interviews which you'd meet with narrators. Did you ask such questions to your narrators? What was the answers? Uh, maybe and maybe we can hear your own uh, opinion, your own position, what, what, for what reason you would uh, uh, go for as, uh, uh, as you, if you can ask or comment that. Uh, so, uh, going um, further uh, on your uh, 
the presentation, you paid uh, very good at, um, attention to your uh, ar archival sources and your own interviews. It is the most wonderful part of each research because I have no <laughs> questions because you uh, told very clearly all the uh, sources and it is I think uh, also in German Academy it's the most important uh, topic when you uh, be uh, if you can specif specify your methodolo methodology and uh, your sources <laughs> that, then <laughs> half a deal will be <laughs> finished already um, and uh, of course for you it is very important to uh, reconstruct the memory of second and third generations in this community. I mean, only in uh, mountain Jewish, uh, Jewish community. But nevertheless, uh, we do have a lot of uh, Holocaust survivors narratives. And you mentioned that you also uh, to, uh, used some of them. And I would like uh, to um, listen about your ideas if you can um, uh, compare these kind of uh, interviews with, uh, with one with another. I mean, if we can compare uh, the narratives of the first generation Holocaust survivors themselves and the second and third generation to what conclusion you can come, whether there would be more Soviet narrative or uh, not Soviet narrative in the third or, uh, or second generation narratives. And of course, which I would uh, personally interest, but I, I think that you would, uh, you do not deal with this uh, topic because it's not your um, in, po point of interest, but still uh, you work with show foundation archives and uh, you saw a lot of um, interviews with mountain Jews, but maybe you uh, uh, followed also or heard uh, some uh, inter uh, some interviews with Holocaust survivors from Ashkenazi Jews who survived here in North Caucasus, yes? And maybe we can uh, go further and compare this kind of narrative before, or, or maybe there would be information. I, uh, uh, me personally, found several interviews uh, uh, of Ashkenazi Jews who talked about surviving the mountain Jews. So that would be the perspective from above, let's say, or from the uh, outside, yes? So they, uh, and it can be um, in deep for your uh, research and to see the other points. Of course, it, uh, uh, it's not the uh, idea of uh, your, uh, of this memory uh, com community, Jewish, mountain Jewish community itself, but if we can uh, look uh, outside, maybe the, uh, that could, uh, also bring something interesting to your topic and to your research. I don't know, this is also uh, only um, a question. And uh, maybe um, it's very interesting uh, uh, coming um, to your results and to your um, uh, what, what, uh, achievements, what you um, understand from these uh, interviews. It's very interesting to me also that uh, uh, Soviet uh, language is used uh, and uh, till now, and uh, the Soviet uh, tradition of uh, commemoration, Soviet uh, Soviet um, heroes are still present in these narratives, and um, this is um, very thrilled uh, to me because uh, when I worked uh, with the Holocaust uh, survivors' narratives, I do not use second and third generation. Narrative, uh, I would say that uh, ninety percent Ashkenazi Jews um, can specify their own, um, uh, the, the, uh, their own uh, memory, and uh, they can uh, say that uh, the way they survived Holocaust is uh, the most important thing in their life. But this uh, goes to Ashkenazi Jews, not to mountain Jews, because, and you saw, you are also absolutely uh, 
um, um, you have right uh, to say that uh, mountain Jews uh, survived only two half a year, or, uh, two months or three months of occupation, yes, and uh, 1,000 victims in comparison with 3,000 victims uh, which died at the front line. Uh, it's, uh, this is very important for community to remember both uh, victims from both sides, let's say, yeah. But still, um, can maybe we can specify the mounting Jewish um, narratives in this way in comparison with Ashkenazi Jews? So uh, what place, what role of uh, Holocaust surviving uh, is in this whole narrative of the whole community? Yes. May, uh, and um, to conclude, maybe I would say that um, uh, you see, I, I would uh, I would like to compare and compare and compare this uh, Ashkenazi survi surviving narrative and uh, Mountain Jews uh, narratives. But to me personally, I I, I never distinguish with the, uh, these um, uh, peculiarities in my work. But still, I am thinking about. It all your presentation and uh, what I would say, I think that uh, the narrative of Holocaust survivors among um, mountain Jews, this, this narrative is more simple than in, in language, in, um, in uh, describing the peculiarities in describing the history itself than uh, the narrative of Ashkenazi Jews uh, who survived, let's say in Stavropol region. Yeah, so uh, maybe you can add something in from your own uh, opinion and perspective and uh, we can go further to these comments and maybe we can have also the questions again. Thank you very much, Irina. Uh, Mateusz, my proposal is that now I will pass the mic to Kirill for mm -hmm. his commentary. After that, I will pass the mic back to you. You will comment on the commentaries and then we'll start Q&A if it's fine with you. All right, so uh, Kiro, please. Please turn on your microphone. We cannot hear you. Can you hear me right now? Now it's perfect. Very good, thank you. First of all, thank you, organizers, and thank you, Mateusz, for this you know, very interesting, extremely interesting uh, presentation. Um, I think my remarks uh, are close to what Irina has just said. It would be intriguing to um, to see what uh, uh, took place, uh, to, uh, what happened to the, to the mountain Jews, um, and how this uh, was uh, passed uh, from generation to generation. Not you know because it was you know in relation to the rest of the Jewish world, uh, and that's why the the comparison here seems to be almost inevitable to me mm, and this of course this uh, gives thought to the general relationship uh, between the re general relationship between this community and the rest of the jewish world i can tell you from my own experience something like 20 years ago i spoke at a conference devoted to, to the mountain jews at barilan university um, and um, several speakers or several persons before me, there was a chief Sephardi uh, rabbi in Israel, a very extremely important, extremely important person. That's why he spoke 40 minutes and I spoke only five. Uh, and most of his uh, talk was uh, dealt with the, I would say, emphasizing how Jewish mountain Jews were and how brilliantly they managed to preserve their Jewish tradition and he returned to this topic, I think, 10 or 20 times. And uh, it was surprising for me, at least as a newcomer to the field, because um, when you come to, to scholarly conference or public events uh, dealing with, for example, European or Ashkenazi Jews, either in Israel or anywhere else, no one speaks about you know, the Jewishness of, uh, of uh, European Jews because it's self-evident. And here it looked like, you know, it was necessary for, for the audience, which was slightly made of uh, mountain Jews, to emphasize this factor. Mm, and uh, 
I remember also when I, you know, in these five minutes when I was speaking at the conference, I spoke, you know, mainly about my major area of expertise at that time, uh, that is a Nazi views on mountain Jews and how these views were translated into the policy on the ground. It, you know, to make a long story short, uh, Mm, the Nazi scholarship was very, very serious. It was, of course, based on the old German um, Oriental scholarship, uh, and they could, and they had experts uh, also in, uh, in in this German academy, um, mainly, for example, mainly to the best of my knowledge, in the University of Tübingen. Uh, but um, also, you know, some SS experts, you know, uh, some ex experts were recruited and served on these uh, uh, SS units that was um, operating in the North Caucasus. Uh, so they did uh, study also during their field trips, so to say, in the Caucasus, the origin language appearance, external appearance uh, of the mountain Jews and also their religion, including the fact whether they there was, uh, they, they could uh, notice Talmud in the houses of mountain Jews. And um, the result, as it was correctly said, that there was actually mm, no clear cut conclusion, which was actually closer to the determination that this group could not be, would not be classified as, a, as Jews. And uh, in fact, mountain Jews managed to convince the Germans, uh, who were in no mood to, to give such uh, presence to anyone else, uh, that there were no Jews. Mm, of course, you know, it was a very shrewd policy, but, um, you know, it's, uh, I think, uh, mountain Jews were able to uh, cleverly exploit the fact that uh, very little was known of them, relatively. Uh, to, to the Western world, including uh, German Academy. Mm, and uh, this uh, lack of communication, uh, and, of, you know, the Germans, if we can say, were particularly interested uh, in um, establishing uh, to what extent mountain Jews were Jews, you know, origin, language, appearance, as everything that they have mentioned. And we see this, um, I would say, uh, this behavior also among the mountain Jews even prior to the occupation. For example, um, uh, a mountain Jewish, uh, a mountain Jew who lived in the North Caucasus in the, in the city of Nalchik, uh, contacted uh, some uh, Polish Jewish refugees who happened to pass through his uh, city, uh, and they told him that they are fleeing because uh, the German army is coming and the Germans are misquoting Jews. And his uh, answer was, but okay, I understand your behavior, but what does it have to do with us? Mm, of course, uh, uh, it is only one evidence, but I think it, you know, it should be seen uh, you know, against the general background. Um, of this phenomenon when um, there was a special group, special Jewish group, which, you know, and the knowledge of its group was very limited. Uh, and the group itself not exactly conceived of itself, perceived itself as being totally linked uh, with the Jewish world. Um, it, can give, it can give us um, some um, ideas uh, about um, um, the memory transmission post-war period um, and to what extent was it nurtured by specifically Jewish factors uh, or by something else. Mm, and we can say at least from what I understood in this presentation and my own sources also confirm this impression that uh, for decades, uh, first post-war decades, a mountain Jews, Jewish memory was uh, closer to, to the Soviet, I would say Soviet, uh, later Russian, uh, fighting mood, uh, which was of course also very much Caucasian spirit. Uh, the emphasis on fighting, struggling, fallen victims, and so on. And uh, the idea that Jews suffered more 
or suffered, especially uh, at the hands of the Germans uh, and other invaders, uh, did, was not particularly popular at that time. Mm, in the last Soviet decades, seventies, uh, eighties, uh, it may be worth uh, remembering that there appeared uh, some um, intellectuals among mountain Jews, uh, elite, mountain Jewish elite, you can say, uh, that started promoting their own unique identity uh, by actually keeping away from the Jews, by emphasizing that there was, you know, a special, a special ethnic group. And in this sense, of course, uh, viewed from this standpoint, Holocaust, which is widely identified as their Jewish event par excellence, um, would hardly dovetail or explicitly dovetail with this new identity. So I would say there should be you know, some other factors that could uh, account for this, um, their, uh, their lot during the Second World War. Uh, in the post uh, in the post Soviet period, everything changed, of course, and um, the, the this mountain Jewish memory uh, does uh, lay much more emphasis on the victimhood. And this sense, we can say that you know the uh, the closing uh, the the gap with the worldwide trends in the Jewish world, probably not only with the Jewish world, but generally speaking, the idea of victimhood who suffered more is extremely important uh, and uh, it is the, you know my interpretation for the idea voiced by 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 by, um, by people who, who Mateo interviewed that we suffered more that is mountain Jews suffered more in during this period more than european or ashkenazi Jews even though the their knowledge of the of, of, of the european jewish holocaust there remains limited as uh, Still, uh, the idea that they um, suffered more than anyone else, I would say, it should be seen also against the background of the general Caucasian um, idea, as I see it now, today's Caucasia, uh, because uh, the idea that Caucasian people suffered uh, disproportionately during the war because of Stalin, Stalin's deportations, quote unquote, is very strong in that region. So mountain Jews, uh, you know, their, their story is different. They didn't suffer uh, from deportation, but the, the idea that we suffered particularly more than other Jews should be seen against uh, this background. And bottom line, I would say it is an extremely interesting case for, for scholarly investigation because uh, despite very many decades, uh, we are still dealing with a um, closely knitted community until now. It's sort of vault in itself, a role guided by its own rules. Sometimes they intersect with, the, with those of the rest of the world. Sometimes they intersect with a Caucasian background or Jewish background, and they definitely developed a, sepa a separate awareness from the rest of the Jews, uh, and which was, of course, uh, nurtured, nurtured by unique factors. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Gil, for your very interesting comments. Thank you very much, Irina, once again, for your interesting comments. And, uh, Mata, the floor is yours. Please comment on the commentaries. Right. <laughs> so, first of all, thank you very much for your comments, uh, Irina and Gil. Uh, so, answering Irina's questions about um, Ashkenazi Jewish testimonies and modern Jewish testimonies. So, um, okay, I can be pretty honest that um, you also know those testimonies given by the mountain Jews. And of course, you know that they are much shorter and the material presented there is rather flat. So, we found in basically every single of these testimonies the same elements. So the war started, we were at the bazaar, at the market, then the bombing started, and then we were hiding for <laughs> two months, and then we went out because Haskil Pinhasov came with his army and he liberated Nalji. So most of them are uh, not that interesting for a researcher, right? Because there is not so many elements he can get from them, right? Uh, on the other hand, when I was uh, speaking with um, with the mountain Jewish Holocaust survivors in Israel and in Nalgic myself, uh, I was 
trying to receive as much information as possible. So I was asking about this history, because there is a story about um, uh, the rabbis from the local uh, synagogue in Nautic who prepared this funeral of the um, uh, Torah, of some holy books, like some prayer books and Torah scrolls, if I remember correctly, uh, at the local cemetery, saying that someone infected with cholera, if I remember correctly, passed away. And I found, for example, one person, because I also thought it's kind of local myth, right? Uh, uh, however, I found a person who participated in this funeral. So, and also he told me in details about what happened there. Uh, and other stories, even more interesting, were given by those mountain Jews who uh, managed to escape Nalchik when they were staying in the uh, Kabardian villages right in the Awuls in Kabardino Balkaria and they are quite exceptional because for a while they were staying in this Awul in a village then they were returning to Nalchik then going back again to the village uh, at some point Germans arrived also to this village but they didn't recognize them as Jewish etc etc so they are a bit more interesting um, but being honest, uh, I never analyzed any um, Ashkenazi testimonies, right? Because in my study, I already compare mostly first of all, second and third generation. So I use only all these testimonies I analyzed uh, as a part of my, let's say, historical chapter. So I use both archival documents, archival material, and oral testimonies. And in this, the whole, let's say, chapter, analytic chapter, right, we call the result chapter, and only based on the second and third generation. But also, I use them to, to see what kind of myths, memories, uh, information were passed to the younger generations. So when I write about second, third, fourth, and fifth, it can, you know, using the second and third generation, in the case of mountain Jews, it's also kind of tricky because there, there are like much more generations already born uh, in most of the families, but let's say so-called second, third generation. Uh, so when I analyze the interviews I collected with the descendants of survivors, I'm trying to find out what kind of memories, what kind of information was remembered and passed and which of them were somehow bypassed by the generation of parents and grandparents. So this is interesting. Uh, I will still be working on this chapter, so it will take a while after I will get all the results, but I will inform you about it uh, for sure. Okay, so testimonies. Um, yeah, about the survival in Nautic, I already said. Um, yeah, so do you have any additional like question to, to what I said? Five reasons of the sub, uh, survival of mountain Jews and your opinion on the survival. So I think that one of the reasons is also that they were really lucky. I think that uh, if this German debate, like scholar debate of all those German institutions, right, that uh, we can see some of the letters uh, in Mordechai Altschwer's book, Yehudei uh, Mizrach Kafkas from 1990, where he translated some of those letters from German to, to Hebrew. Uh, I suppose that at this certain point, Germans would finally decide to annihilate the, the mountain Jews. So I think that, of course, these factors were important and they gave the mountain Jewish community some extra time. But uh, I wouldn't say that the uh, Kabardian puppet government or mountain Jew Jewish leaders had any real influence on the German decision-making process. Like, totally not. Uh, so, so, of course, the peer camp elements, uh, but also there were so many institutions, so many organs, like governmental organs, some research institutions, and also military forces uh, included in this uh, whole process. I suppose that certain part, they would finally decide that they should do what they did without analyzing all these elements in Bogdanov and Mianzysko. So just make them prepare mass execution. And also in the memory of the local uh, mountain Jews from Nautic, there is this element that uh, when Husky Pinchasov came and he liberated Nautic, the Germans were already prepared. They were digging the holes to, to shoot all the Jews and uh, bury them there. So I suppose it was only a question of time. 
questions now. Right? Okay. Uh, so if uh, this is everything what is related to the comments, uh, let's uh, go to the uh, last part of our meeting today, uh, the Q and A. So uh, I've got a one question um, uh, mentioned from uh, Jan Nasliva. So please turn on your microphone, turn on your camera, and uh, we'll listen. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Mateusz, for um, your really interesting uh, presentation. And um, I have two questions. So one question is about uh, the third, the second and the third generation. Um, I wonder if they are part of groups, uh, like a 3G group, uh, specifically of Mountain Jews um, descendants. And if there is an interest um, among the descendants of, um, of survivors in the Holocaust, in learning about the Holocaust, in telling the stories um, of, their, um, of their parents, of their um, grandparents. And connected to that is, do they ever speak about the um, intergenerational transmission of uh, trauma? Uh, so that's the first question. Um, the second question is more about geography. So I know that you focus on Russia, you focus on Israel, but I wonder um, if you would be, um, if you would consider kind of extending uh, your, your focus to the US, if it makes sense at all to look at um, survivors who settled in the US, uh, who to look at descendants um, who settled in the U.S. and how and compare that? How different um, do they, res uh, you know, their their responses and let's say their memories? How different are they in the U.S. compared to um, the areas that you um, that you study? So thank you. Okay, so answering your question about the second third generation. Uh, for example, in a small towns where there is like kind of noticeable mountain Jewish communities, like in southern Israel, in the Shevas, Devot, etc., there are the um, there are few community clubs uh, opened by the Caucasian Kafkazi uh, immigrants, and these community clubs and local organizations they organize. Uh, every few years some kind of trips to the Caucasus and for youth from the real local um, mountain Jewish youth living in Israel already born in Israel and during those trips they visit not only um, this most important centers of the mountain Jewish culture like Derbent and Baku and Kuba in Azerbaijan but also every time they visit the memorials in Bogdanov Kamianzinskoye and they also go to Nautic and study about the local, uh, the, the fate of the local Jewish community during the war. So, so there is a certain interest, but on the other hand, it's hard to say how widespread this approach is like of the youth, because if every few years, I don't know, 10 or 15 teenagers uh, go to the Caucasus, it doesn't mean that at large, the, the, this generation, of mountain Jews uh, born and raised in Israel is that interested in this heritage. And when it comes to, to the intergenerational trauma, uh, being honest, uh, it's it would be very hard to compare like the experience of the mountain Jews and the Ashkenazi community. So like basically without ghettos, concentration camps and a very short period of occupation, I would say that uh, talking and spending like dozens of hours discussing these issues with second third generation i haven't noticed any kind of trauma as present in the mountain jewish 2g and 3g no 3g not really 2g especially right so not really uh, answering your question about the us uh, so do you mean like um, also including the the mountain jewish community in us yes Okay, so um, uh, first of all, uh, I'm in touch with some uh, mountain Jewish leaders from New York. And uh, interestingly, in Brooklyn, there is also a monument uh, dedicated to the memory of the mountain Jewish um, victims and survivors of the Holocaust. Uh, it is right, you know. Yeah. Okay. 
So, uh, so there is this also place of memory where the local community meets on, on the Victory Day, on the 9th of May, especially. Uh, but what I noticed that those participating in any kind of, um, you know, uh, commemorative events in, in, uh, in, the, in New York are mostly elderly people. So I haven't seen much youth. And but I never being honest was in touch with the Caucasian uh, synagogues in, in the States or with some youth groups. Uh, but I thought that, you know, already comparing Israel and Russia, it's, um, it's a lot of work, right? So making the study even more complicated with all this American aspect, um, I, I, I wasn't thinking about it, honestly. So not yet, at least. You know. All right, thank you very much for uh, for the question and thank you very much for the answer. Do we have some uh, further questions to Mateusz? Uh, if not for a moment, I hope uh, I will uh, use this opportunity being a chair and I will ask a question, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, in the very end, you referred to, um, to Aleida Asman and her comparison between the um, to, to these elements of the collective memory, which are uh, significant and distinguished for the Western Europe. So the common memory of the Holocaust, which in a way is based for the common European identity. Uh, and on the other hand, you mentioned that for the West, for the Eastern Europe, uh, this kind of common uh, element, uh, which also is visible in your in your interviews with the mountain Jews is the memory of the great patriotic war. So uh, definitely more victorious in the Holocaust. It's uh, in a way somehow in on the side. But uh, as I remember correctly, Aleida Asman was writing that um, uh, as far as it's uh, not really established yet, uh, the big possibility uh, is also that uh, the memory of the Stalin purges uh, can be something like a common element, which uh, which will be an uh, element of the collective memory of Eastern Europeans, uh, Caucasians, and so on. So my questions, uh, my question is uh, about uh, appearances of these cases of uh, the memory about the Stalin purges, how it co it's combined with the memory of the mountain Jews about the about the Holocaust. Uh, whether this issue is uh, mentioned at all, uh, or it's uh, avoided in the in the in the narratives of your interviewees. All right, thank you very much for this question. Um, being honest, I heard only a few times about some um, ancestors of my interlocutors who were uh, victims of these purges, but I wouldn't say that this topic uh, is that important in the collective memory of the mountain Jewish community. First of all, uh, I would say that in all the regions that are not that much, that weren't in the center of the Soviet Union, right, like Ukraine, Central Russia, etc., the, the form of this purges was, of course, awful. Yes, uh, it was awful uh, for after the war for the Chechens. Uh, it was awful for Balkars in Kabardino Balkaria. Uh, but uh, most of the mountain Jews I spoke with, they never really mentioned this topic. Only when asked about, for example, what happened to your father that he died in 1937, let's say. Uh, the answer was like, mm, they took him, we didn't know what happened, and then we got like a letter that he was murdered somewhere in Siberia or he died of some disease. Uh, but basically, there, there is one book published a few years ago by Irina Mikhailova, where she lists uh, some few hundred mountain Jewish victims of the Stalin purges. Uh, nonetheless, at this grassroots level, it's, this memory doesn't really function, I would say. It's interesting, but, but it doesn't, basically. It's only some very few stories, very few people I met, so not really. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, if I can build up on that, um, I'm not a specialist in the North, the North, uh, North Caucasus, rather in the South Caucasus, that's the main area of more expertise, but uh, as far as I know, um, the mountain Jews uh, who still are living in the uh, in uh, in uh, Azerbaijan very often they are mentioning uh, contemporary that actually there is a 
very strong policies, the policy of Azerbaijani statehood, which we call, call the Azerbe Azerbaijanization of uh, ethnic minorities uh, or in the Azerbaijan. So my question is like whether in these interviews, I know that it's not really uh, related with your main topic, but maybe in these interviews, and it's from my personal interest, uh, you, uh, some of your interviewees were mentioning some uh, problems with keeping their identity, separate identity from the from the state identity, which is very strongly promoted in Azerbaijan nowadays. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the beginning of your question because something went wrong with my internet connection. So could you please repeat only just the first part? And uh, you need to turn on the speaker was was bad uh, i'm sorry uh, thank you Wojtek. uh so the question is related with the other the process of azerbaijanization uh, azerbaijanization of the mountain Jews, of uh, those mountain Jews who left in the azerbaijan uh, i know that it's not related uh, entirely with your topic of your discussion but maybe some of your interviews were mentioning uh, that this process in a way is affecting their identity uh, nowadays uh, okay, so the answer will be pretty short because, uh, being honest with you, I've never been to Azerbaijan and I've never met uh, a mountain Jewish person originating from Azerbaijan in my life. So it's like I, I know people from Dagestan, from Chechnya, Kabardino Balkaria, but uh, Azerbaijan was never part of my interest, being honest. And also, there is quite a lot of research nowadays in that band and in uh, Krasna Swabadayas in Kuba. Uh, so, so I, I never really uh, been there, which I'm very sorry about, uh, but uh, I, I just cannot answer your question, you know, because I, haven't, I have no acquaintance with uh, Azerbaijan mountain Jews. All right, thank you very much. Uh, do we have some further questions, maybe some additional comments from uh, Irina or Kirill? All right, if not. Yeah. Maybe I will say some words and it's also about the plans for the future. <laughs> so you may I mentioned that uh, you made uh, 104 interviews by your own and it's like a um, great archive, archival material, would, uh, I would say. But still, uh, you are the only one owner <laughs> of this um, uh, archive. Uh, would you plan to put these interviews online somewhere, uh, someone, and uh, maybe you will uh, plan to col collaborate with, for example, Santa Sefer or someone with whom, because I do have also several interviewers, not so many, but still, and maybe we can uh, think about it in the future and to put it online about uh, North Caucasus, uh, not only Mountain Jews, Jews, but also Ashkenazi as well. What do you think? Uh, so yes, the, the Sefer Center would be a good idea, but I was also thinking about the uh, Abraham Harman Institute, so Oral History Division in uh, Jerusalem, because they have some very interesting projects about the, they're in possession of those projects of the oral history of the mountain Jews from the 1970s and 1980s. So one was the, was the collection of uh, Mordechai Altrue, uh, like the first corpus of interviews with the mountain Jews and the other from the 1980s collected by Konstantin Miroshnik where he did the whole project about uh, non-Ashkenazi communities of the Soviet Union. So he interviewed mountain Jews, Bukharian Jews and Georgian Jews for his project. So I thought that it would be, you know, kind of proper place to, to, to send this material since it's, you know, they have already two kind of large corrections, collections of um, interviews with the mountain Jews. So this was what I was thinking about. Okay, uh, Kirill, maybe some comment from you? Well, I can tell you, you know, uh, that, you know, my late supervisor, who was a great uh, scholar on mountain Jews, Professor Maldekai Altshoda, uh, told me once uh, that um, he also, you know, he personally interviewed, you know, very many mountain Jews and told me that their interviews are relatively short as compared to those of uh, European Jews. But he said, these people, you know, are it is mountain Jews, are generally less educated. And that's why they express themselves uh, themselves in a shorter way. And that's why he told me that their testimonies are more authentic. People who are true intellectuals, 
love, you know, so he, he wants the tend to, uh, at least that's what he said. Uh, I tend to provide too many details which sound as a less plausible. And that's why, I mean, there is, at least from his point of view, there, is, there was a special value in mounting Jewish testimonies. So good luck with that. All right, Mateusz, uh, I will- I'll... Thank you very much. <laughs> Mateusz, a uh, few words to sum it up. Uh, no, I'm fine. I want to say that I'm very grateful for your comments and for your questions. And uh, it was a very good experience indeed. I, I can say that I was really stressed. Like I'm, I'm always for every kind of lecture, conference, etc. But it really went great. So thank you very much, Irina, Kirill, that uh, Indeed, in my opinion, it went great. And thank you very much for this fascinating lecture. Thank you very much to Irina and Kirill for your commentaries. Uh, thank you all for the participation uh, in my own name and also in the name of the Institute of Political Studies uh, of Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, please, you can follow us on uh, 